Welcome to another edition of the Heron Outlet. She is Alex Winley. He is Austin Robillard back with us. And I am Ian Hest. On today's show, the Herons are continuing to fly high. Five unbeaten now. They also have an MLS player of the week. And Damian Lowe, we'll talk about really where he's going and beyond. And Inter Miami is not the only team in our area getting in a playoff mix. We'll talk about that a little later in the show. But guys, let's start with the big 2-1 win over Toronto FC in front of a rock and drive pink stadium, improving for the time up to fifth in MLS's Eastern Conference. Uh, really, like I said, winners uh, of two in a row now, five unbeaten, 3-2-0 and in that uh, time span, second best. In the Eastern Conference, it was a howler from uh, Alex Bono, but off a, a foot of John Mota that continues to be, re, uh, uh, you know, firing from distance. We'll talk about that in just a sec. Uh, and, and then the game winner uh, and, and a little bit of gritty along with it uh, yeah. in a 2-1 win. So, Alex, let's start with you just uh, continuing this momentum. We talked about it last week where this seems to be a team that is peaking at the right time. And uh, as as the schedule, you look towards w- what's coming up, you, you have to help but feel a little more confident now instead of just what are we doing, what can we do here in, in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, and I think that win really gave Miami some confidence and it cemented them as serious competitors in the East um, um, nationally. I, I, you know, Toronto was coming off a, a really good a streak of wins and draws with their two Italians. And now, you know, that was a big talking point going into that game. And, you know, Miami, you know, they didn't shy away from that. And they just really, they took it to Toronto. And, um, you know, in that previous podcast we recorded, I, I just had a feeling, I, I knew that them having a midweek game then going over to South Florida, playing in that heat and humidity, I, I just knew that by the 60th, 70th minute, they're going to be gassed. And up there in the press box, we saw that, you know, Bernadeschi was, Tired, Insignia was cramping up, and they just lost a lot of momentum there at the end. And I think that as a whole really, um, um, you know, drove uh, Inter Miami forward. And I, I think that definitely helped them. Of course, you know, uh, you know, having Mott to score, you know, it it was a howler, but you know, he he got his his goal and, and last year getting on the score sheet, I think that helps as well. But and and also, I think it shows that even when Pozuelo was man marked, you know, it you know Miami can still find a way to get goals. So. I think that's the most important thing out of anything, uh, out of any of this. You know, Pozuelo could be marked out of the game, but, you know, Miami can still have an impact, whether it be, you know, a winger or, or a central midfielder. So I think as the season goes on, it, it's crunch time. I know Neville likes to use the every uh, game is a, a cup final, and really it is. You know, next game uh, against the Red Bulls could be super important. And Miami could be fighting for a home playoff spot now, so. You know, it was just a really intriguing game from both sides, and the narratives going into it were crazy, but Miami showed that they were prepared for it. Yeah, something I said to you guys in the press box and we talked about with a couple of other the people that sit up there was that every time we go and sit down in there, we look at each other like, yep, Miami's got to win this one. And it just feels yeah. like for the last couple of weeks, like it's been like that. And yeah. that's only going to become more and more true as time goes on. And with how other results are shaping around the league, it looks like not only are they can they solidify themselves as a playoff team with a couple of wins down the stretch, but they could fight for what Alex just said, a, a home playoff game, which is insane. Like they're not far off from fourth in the East. I think. Ian, you mentioned it to me. If they beat Red Bulls on Saturday, they're two points behind. With they control the their hands. own destiny. They control their own yeah. destiny for home field advantage. So for if you said field... everything is a cup final, they won out. Hypothetically, right. they would be. They would have a home field. The yeah. end because of that game against Orlando. Orlando with the win, uh, I think would put them above just on goal differential. They've got the same exact record, but the one goal differential, which crazy to think about is a Damian Lowe own goal back then uh yeah. the 90th plus minute so if that if that doesn't happen let's, let, let's stop, pause there though because Inter Miami have won plenty of games in the last kick of the ball this season that's true yeah. that's true but I, I will say if there wasn't for an own goal they'd have the same exact record all across the board even with the goal differential so they're right there and something else I want to notice uh point out too before we actually get into what happened in the Toronto match um if you told me at this point in the season that Miami would have the 10th best record in MLS. I would be surprised. Yeah. Like they are, the, they are a top 10 team in the, well, I guess 11th because of the Orlando game, but after Saturday, they were a top 10 team in MLS in terms of their record. And and the they power have, rankings put them somewhere around ninth, 10th. And I, and honestly, I would, I would agree with that. I, and I, not, and I, I don't think that that's any, 
I think that this team has always been that. How many podcasts did we do time and time again where we were saying, you know, this team is good. They're just losing. Yeah. I, nothing is really, yeah. I mean, yes, Pozuelo makes a huge difference. And that obviously changed everything. But you can go back to New England, right? This is well before Pozuelo got here. Over the past 21 games, Inter-Miami is 10-5-6. and six. That's 35 points. Over that exact same 21 games, Philadelphia is 9-8-4. and four. That's 35 points. Over 21 games, way more than half the season, Inter-Miami is neck and neck tied on points with the number one seed in the Eastern Conference and the only team really that has any chance of, of a, a supporter shield run against LAFC. So th- this is and has been for, I mean, what? That goes back to April now. So we've got like a four-month sample size here. And, and even you look at the losses, because I really do want to talk about it, was, you know, th- that record even there is deceiving. After you get past the four losses to, to start the year, the, the, the remaining six at New England, at Charlotte, at Atlanta, at Orlando, at New York City, and then you have the Philadelphia one at home. That's the six. Like, those are all games that you, any team in the league, you'd go, eh, okay, maybe they dropped one there, yeah. maybe they dropped one here. None of those go, what the heck were they doing? They've got I honestly the- think, yeah. uh, sorry to cut you off, but I want to I bring up the losses. I think that the biggest disappointment in those results is actually not those results at all. It's the 4-4 draw against Cincinnati. Yeah. Like yeah, that one, hurt, that hurts sure. more than a loss to one of those teams in those circumstances, genuinely. Sorry, go and, on. And no, but I'm just saying that they're also 8-3-3 three, and three at home. But Dry Pink has become one of the toughest places to play in all of MLS. And MLS is a league where home field advantage is way bigger than in other leagues around the world. They've yeah. got the third best home record in all of MLS. And that's really where they're making up a lot of the points. Now, like you had said, Alex, this is when you go on the road at Red Bulls, at crew, <clears throat> that you're really going to start to get tested. Yeah. And I also want to talk about the timing of this run, too. This is their best stretch of five games within the league since the beginning of the season. They, they This is their best stretch throughout the entire season. They had a, they had a stretch where they um, were unbeaten in five, but one of them had to do with the Miami FC Open Cup game. So within MLS, this is their best stretch of five games. And you talk about the timing of it. They've submitted themselves in fifth place or sixth place in the Eastern Conference with other teams now having to do the catch-up work. The timing is impeccable, and if they can keep it up, then they're going to be a playoff team 100%. They control their own destiny, which is insane. Not only do they control their own destiny, they control their own destiny for a home playoff game, which is nuts. Which is crazy to think after the start they had. You know, that 5-1 loss to Austin, uh, yeah, it was bad. (laughs) Nothing more to say there, but, you know, the the turnaround that this team has made and uh, like Ian mentioned earlier, it's not just Pozuelo. It's everyone really buying in. And you, you heard Lowe uh, uh, um, in his post-match conference against uh, Toronto talking about how the team, is, they're they are acting like people who haven't eaten in like years with this this drive and desire that 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 they're trying to get on with the playoffs uh, in right now. So it's just, it's just really, um, you know, the turnaround has been really impressive. And, and um, you know, some of the wins that they have picked up over the season – you know, Red Bulls at home, Portland at home, at Dry Pink, um, you know, the Toronto match and um, <clears throat> some of these other uh, uh, fixtures that y- you thought that they would have lost, especially the, the Union games, uh, both home and away. I think I believe they drew both of those. So points like that, I think it, it just shows that they're serious about uh, making the playoffs this year. And the fact that they have a potential home field advantage is it's it's huge. You know, it, it is funny because I think about the, the conversation that we were having last year where it was like, oh, if only they were just average on the road, they'd be in yeah. the playoff hunt, right? That was what we used to talk about last year. This year, it's, oh, if only they were average on the road, then they'd be one of the top teams in, in the Eastern Conference. And, and that just goes to show what they've also done is they've taken draws and made them wins, right? Yeah. That, that's really what it's been down to, that, that you're, 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 you know, even your your one ones against Minnesota now two one your one one you know your your Charlotte another example of that uh, th- those games turned into three points which I think has a lot to do with uh, the ability to make a run like they have over the past you know sort of let, let's go back to right I had said at the beginning of August that I had thought if they got zero to six points in this month they were out of it. Seven and nine, they were sort of in the mix. Ten, they're probably in the playoff hunt and, and probably secured more or less in the playoff hunt. Well, there's two games to go. They've already hit 10 points this month. 
So they're already there. So I, like that's why I said to you guys, and, and I know that you might disagree with me, I'm actually not as nervous about the Red Bulls game because that to me is is icing on the cake. They they've taken I'm a care nervous of the about game. Columbus, honestly. Yeah, right. Columbus is something to worry about. And, and that's why just you know, don't give yourself the crazy pressure of New York Red Bulls. Obviously, everybody wants to win every single game, but you know, if if you needed a breather, here's here's probably the time. I, I don't know if either of you disagrees with that, but because I understand. I mean I'm nervous. I think there's work to do. I mean, a hundred percent, there's so yeah. much work to do and yes, they control their own destiny, but that goes with winning games. So for me, having all of these high pressure games, the two games against Columbus, the one game left against Orlando, I mean, especially it being moved to a midweek match at the last week of the season, which is on Rosh Hashanah, by the way, on Rosh so. Yeah. Like, on a, like, it's just, <laughs> I mean, it, it is, it's, it's unfathomable, but to say the least, there's a, still a lot of work to be done. Um, I would like a point out of the Red Bulls game to give me a little bit more security because at this point, are we really worried about a home playoff game? No, we're worried about getting into the playoffs, at least in my mind. Um, and maybe that's a little bit pessimistic, but that's just where my head is. I want to get that. I just five, six or seven. I'm, I'm happy. As long as you get in, you're good because anything can happen in MLS. Yeah. Um, so this Red Bulls game for me, like I want to get us. I just want to, I want something to be taken away from it because I think that it's important for them to get a point going into these high pressure games where if they do drop one against Columbus, then it's yes, going to be bad. However, you still have one more to make up for it. The Orlando game is going to be huge. You've got the Montreal game at the last game of the season, which by the way, could be huge for them because yeah. Montreal are probably going to secure the second or third spot, no matter what. So maybe Montreal doesn't take it as hard. So there's, there's a lot to be said for that final week of the season, but it's just about getting there. It's just about continuing the form and getting there that I'm most worried about, but they haven't shown any signs of slowing down, so I'm completely okay with it. And by the way, Columbus did show signs of going, slowing down in that match against Atlanta. They, they were really not bad. the best team. They did they were not the best team, especially in that first half. Cucho came and saved them 100%, um, but they still ended up conceding a late goal to an Atlanta side that kept pushing. So and that was at home for Columbus as well. So it kind of gives me a little bit of hope there. You mentioned that anything can happen in the MLS playoffs. Take last year, RSL was the seven seed, made it all the way to the Western Conference Finals. So I, there's definitely precedence there. Alex, I want to talk about the win and the, the style of play. Um, you know, when we were talking after the game, th this had the potential of turning into that Cincinnati game. It was end to end for much of the second half, almost, you know, 35, 40 minutes of the end of that second half. Uh, was was not played in the middle third. Uh, I really had the, the the opportunity to get people gassed. We had we were talking about how tired Toronto looked really at the end because you get that goal off a howler that wasn't really deserved. Uh, another one of those long range uh, Steph Curry esque, let's call it shots Steph from Curry -esque. <laughs> going. Uh, you know, let, let's just see how far back he can get. He's he's now at twenty six. Yeah, honestly. 26 and a third on his average shots, 43 shots this year. He's taken only nine of them have been on target. Uh, but really what you, what you saw in there was a team that I, I guess in that chaos is finding comfort. Like they're, they're really figuring out how to play that style, which yeah. gives you some hope. Like they, they did that whole bend don't break. They did it against Montreal. They did it against NYCFC. You know, even even Toronto had they got the one goal off of the Insigne masterclass uh, and what they had 11 shots, but only 0. 0.5, 0. 0.6 XG. So I think that that really just goes to show how this defense is like absorbing pressure and, and sort of OK with keeping everything in front of them. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's a testament to the back line, really. I know people were, are, were earlier in the season calling for, you know, another center back. But, you know, defense is it just fixed by getting another defender, you know, that, that doesn't plug a lot of holes. And oftentimes defense is a team effort. So, you know, if you're saying, you know, fix the defense, just get another center back. It's not that simple. It's a system, you know, the center backs play badly when their midfielders step out and they have the cover, then they have space in behind. And, you know, that's bad defense because the team as a whole collapsed. Getting back to the center backs that Inter-Miami do have, I think that the team was able to fix that. And now you see with, um, uh, with Damian Lowe and Ryan Saylor against Toronto, they, they 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 were massive, and it's it's really incredible because Ryan Saylor's only a rookie, and it, it's 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 his first uh, 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 it's his first season in the league, and uh, you know he's already showing that he's progressing so well, and 
and you know has become a bit of a mainstay, almost pushing Ame Mabika out of that 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 starting lineup. And he he he's done well. You know, uh, of course there are some moments where he's a little shaky, but he's a rookie. That's fine. But you know, um, you know he's just a monster in the air. He he looks comfortable on the ball. He he likes those progressive passes and partnering against a guy like Lowe, who's just super aggressive. I think it's a nice balance right there. And I think especially those last couple of minutes against. Uh, against Toronto, they were getting peppered from just every side. And, and Christmas McVeigh, he was, he was always tracking back and, you know, he, he was almost getting cooked from, from Bernadeschke at times, but he, he, you know, they, they didn't break. They, they held on, they didn't bend. And, it, you know, it was just a defensive display that, you know, what, if they get, if, when they get into the playoffs, you know, sometimes you have to win ugly and, and bunker down and, and, you know, try not to get, uh, let in a last ditch goal. So I, I think, um, you know, games like this are perfect practice for later in the year if or when they do make the playoffs and, um, you know, let, you know, they have to bunker down and get that that point, you know, or three points, you know, it, um, it's good practice. One thing that really kind of just is a testament to the defense, if you guys want to go look at it right now, look at the shot chart for Toronto and look at where they were taking their shots. It literally looks like there they is a wall. It, everything was outside the box. You had five shots inside the box, but three of them don't really count because they were at the top right of the box that were still 18 yards away with no threat to calendar. They had two shots inside of the box, one in the 20th minute and one in the 74th. So for the majority of the game, Toronto, Alex, you said it perfectly. They were defending with the ball in front of them the entire match, and they were doing it extremely well. And if they weren't and the ball did end up breaking the line, the amount of recoveries that we saw from Ryan Saylor and Damian Lowe and DeAndre Yedlin and even Chris McVay Unbelievable. And one thing I want to say about Chris McVay as well, and Phil Neville made a point at this uh, in the post-game press conference, was about defending Bernadeschi and using him as a wingback because of his right-footed ability. And when you have somebody like Bernadeschi who likes to cut inside, you favor a right-footed left-back at times because he's able to defend a lot more comfortably to a player of that stature. And honestly, I think that he executed this defensive game plan against this red-hot Italian Toronto attack perfectly 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 and if it wasn't for that insigne volley leaning falling down to the far corner like which is just a testament to his world-class ability yeah then you you keep a clean sheet here you keep a clean sheet and also drake calendar again extremely commanding coming out of the box exactly what you want from a keeper going and catching balls i mean everything that alex just said spot on and if you look at the shot chart it is exactly it shows you exactly what she said the other thing that Phil had talked about was blocking shots, which I, I think sometimes goes uh, a little under the radar because people, you know, just look at shots on target versus shots off target and, and block shots don't really come. Damian Lowe's now first in all of MLS in terms of block shots with 72. He also has a top five company in Chris McVay, who's fourth in all of MLS with 67. So you have two of your, your four, you know, backs that are, that are in the top five in MLS and block shots definitely makes job easier on your keeper. Um, and, and Drake is enjoying the, the fruits of that labor. But Damian Lowe again named to the MLS team of the week. Um, I, I think it's, is it four this time that he's been a, a substitute or, or he's had a couple of them yeah. um, throughout this year. He gets the assist on the game winning goal, which uh, Phil, Phil did say he is counting that as a, from a set piece. So Austin, you get your throwing goal. <laughs> I, I've been very critical for those who are wondering why I'm laughing. Uh, Inter Miami. Now that now that I'll say this, you'll un, be unable to see it. I have never seen a team struggle with throw-ins quite like Inter Miami uh, has had this year. They <laughs> really have struggled to get the ball in off throw-ins for whatever reason. It's a little funny, um, but this does count as a as a set piece goal because it came off a throw-in. I, I guess in the in the minds of many. Uh, he did have that assist. He had seven recoveries, to your point, Austin, on all of those. Two more blocks, four clearances. He was two of three on tackles, five of seven on duels. That's a heck of a workload for a 90 minutes. Talk about earning your paycheck. Damian Lowe really uh, did that against Toronto. Um, but I also really like where he comes from from a leadership perspective. We don't necessarily talk about it so much because you have Gregory, who is such like a communal person, um, that it's able to, to be that friendly, you know, guy that puts your, his arm around you and, and helps lead is such a good leader, both in his play and in, and in his, you know, off the field stuff. Then you have DeAndre Yedlin, who's sort of that calming presence and, and really everything. Drake Callender is directing everybody in traffic. You have so many of these different options. 
But then you still have Damian Lowe, who organizationally, in the moment, in games, has been the go-to guy to direct what every, but where everybody needs to be. And that's really what you want from your main center back. Especially partnering with a rookie center back in Ryan Saylor. I mean, that's that was a thing I asked him about at the end of the game. I said, just give me your thoughts on Saylor because this guy's a rookie. I know he's an older rookie, but he's a rookie, doesn't have that much experience. And they seem to play off of each other like they've had a center back partnership for three or four years now. Like, I, I honestly thought it was one of the best partnerships at the center back position that we have seen from Inter Miami all season long. Um, so yeah, hundred percent Damian Lowe deserves a ton of credit. I mean, obviously Ryan Taylor too, but the leadership and the way that he speaks as well. I don't know if you guys notice it, but I love when Damian Lowe speaks. He's my, he's probably if one of, if not my favorite player to come to a post game press conference or talk in training. I love the way he speaks about the team. I love the way he speaks about the club. I love the yeah. way he speaks about other players. And it just sh- goes to show how much of a leader this guy is without the captain's armband. Yeah, I agree. I think. I, I think it just comes from, you know, um, I have a lot of Jamaican friends and, and we're in group chats constantly and they watch the national team and, and they always say live by the low, die by the low. And that's essentially his playing style, just being uber aggressive sometimes, maybe to the detriment of the team. But there are other times that aggressiveness is so good for Miami and, and, and needed for Miami, you know, like uh, the Toronto game, for instance, there were just a couple of moments where you know, um, you know, Toronto could have snuck in, in behind, but, you know, low with his last ditch tackling, I, th- I thought, you know, he got injured on that play, but, you know, his uh, interception essentially maybe saved the goal for, for Miami and, 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 you know, kept the, the uh, kept them from scoring uh, Toronto from scoring again. So I think Damian Lowe, I think, you know, he's uh, underrated, I think by the national media, I, I do think he's, he's really good. I think, you know, if he was playing for like a, uh, you know, I don't know, a Seattle or LAFC, I think he, he would have gotten more uh, praise, but uh, Lowe has just been a uh, steady Eddie and him and Saylor, you know, we said this about Mubika earlier as well. I think, you know, just forming a partnership uh, is, um, has been really good for Miami and, and his, his just, his ability to, to, to just get Miami out of trouble sometimes, even though it can be erratic, but his play style is, is really needed for the team at times. And, and you saw it against Toronto. Moving up the spine, because I really think that that's where a lot of, you know, it's interesting to say most of the earlier on in the season, uh, a lot of the head scratching came from the crosses that were low percentage. They, they would move the ball wide. Now a lot of the success seems to be coming through the spine. A lot of that coming from the midfield partnership of Jean Mota and Gregory. Um, and and it, it almost seems like a weekly occurrence for me that at the end of the first half at halftime, I'm sitting there, I'm looking at who had a great performance in the first half. And the person who jumps off the page is Jean Mota. He scores again, albeit on a crazy shot. I know we keep going back to that. By the way, that that shot had an XG of 0.03. So 97% of the time, that shot is not supposed to be uh, anything that troubles the keeper. And probably even more so uh, with the spill like Bono had. Uh, yeah. But John Mota, every single week, it just looks like he's all over the place um, in terms of making direct contributions to to the offense, to to possession mostly. Um, he's really, and, and to defense, to so winning the ball back. And he's allowed Gregory some freedom to really enjoy himself a little bit more. Gregory, I was telling you this, Austin, before we got started, is first in all of MLS in terms of tackles won with 71 tackles. That's 19 better than number two. It's unbelievable how far ahead Gregory is in terms of tackles won this season in all of MLS. Um, so when you have a defensive structure and defensive midfield like that, uh, it really provides a lot of um, joy, I guess, to, to the surrounding parts. You think of guys like Lasseter, who when you get involved every single time, I, I feel like I turn to you guys, I'm like, why? Maybe get out Lasseter a little more involved. Um, you see what happens. And, and, and guys yeah. like Pozuela, right? So, it, But it allows you the option to do that. And, and I really think that Gregory and Mota combined, when they're not getting yellow cards and when they're not getting sent off, uh, really provide a lot more for, for the Central <laughs> Miami team. Yeah, I think I think Pozuelo has a lot to do with that. I think he's given them. Oh, here we go. Less of a response. No, 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 no. <laughs> in a good way. In a good way. We're gonna get to that discussion, and we will. But in a good way, Alejandro Pozuelo has taken a lot of the offensive responsibility, of course. And when you were playing that double pivot earlier on in the year without that creative playmaker in the spine of the team. As Ian just said, the increase in the play uh, from the spine of the team has has gotten so, so, so much better. And without Pasuelo there, Gregory and Malta were having 
so much responsibility offensively and defensively. And I think that you see their numbers just going up and up and up and up and up because you have Pozuelo to be in front of you. You don't have to worry about it as much. You see Jean Mota putting in a bunch of tackles and still being that uh, facilitator of the ball with his back to goal and looking forward up the pitch. Gregory just is always going to do what Gregory does, and he's just been phenomenal at it. Um, something like like Alex just said with Damian Lowe, it's almost the same thing. You live by Gregory, you die by Gregory. You let yeah. him be that aggressor. It's the same exact thing. If you have those two guys in front of each other in the middle of the pitch, it's going to be a, a huge, huge complaint from other teams because – they're just so menacing, but yeah, I think Pozuelo has a, un- unlocked uh, a lot of what Gregory and Malta can do with a little bit more freedom uh, and less responsibility in terms of going forward. It lets them defend. Well, I think that's why Gregory's tackles are up so high. And also at the same time, it relieves pressure off them to advance the ball forward and they can take their time and try and get it to a Pozuelo who can help break the lines. Yeah. And I think that's a good point you bring up I, I, Pozuelo. He's, he's a luxury player and that's fine. He's the creative force of the team. And so having two midfielders like Gregory and John Mata behind him essentially gives him license to roam and do whatever. And um, sometimes it, it doesn't work out like the Toronto game. You know, he was essentially, you wouldn't you guys say he was man marked most of the time. He didn't really get into it too much, but you know, he had two guys in Mata and Gregory behind him that, you know, Gregory was just intercepting everything. And then he had John Mata lively, offensively and you know uh, of course it was a, a goalkeeper howler but you know Mata got on the score sheet again so I think that midfield uh, like we all predicted when Pozuelo was uh, heading to the team it, it, it's a nice balance because you have a box-to-box high in John Mata you have Gregory just focusing on uh, doing what he does best which is defending intercepting and Pozuelo that luxury guy who can link up with Iguain and, and you know just create for other players and and have that impact. And then you, you you pile on guys like Lasseter and Taylor on the wings who are creative players, but maybe not the focal point of the team. And they're just nice complimentary uh, uh, players to a guy like Pozuelo. And, and now all of a sudden, and Bryce Duke as well. And we've seen that him and uh, Pozuelo and Duke can start together as well. You know, now we're seeing a nice balance between the team. And now there are, there are um, uh, just positions to be uh, fought with and, you know, like it, it's two per position. So players have competition there and, and, and that in turn raises the entire team's level. So uh, I think it's just, uh, you know, his impact cannot be understated, but it's just not Pozuelo. It's the entire team just kind of raising their level. Alex, I wanted to ask you, because the decision to to really, we were wondering in that midfield battle, who, who was going to be the guy that Malta and Gregory were going to have to sort of take out of the game. Um, you know, it was Morales against uh, NYCFC. I was interested to see that it was Jaden Nelson um, yeah. instead of Osorio or my, uh, or Michael Bradley. They, they went with Jaden Nelson, really just shut him down altogether. And it, it almost like put Toronto into quicksand for, for large portions of the game. Even when Toronto had the ball, it was very slow. It was very molasses-like. It, there, there wasn't a lot of movement. <laughs> molasses, Toronto. Maple yeah. Syrup. <laughs> but, but just that yeah. idea of, of, of why they chose him compared to, and, and maybe where uh, you can look to the future. Because, I mean, are you going to do it with a Lewis Morgan? That's a very different game against Red Bulls that they're going to have to play. Uh, yeah. how, how do you see that in terms of the decision to go with Nelson? I thought was very interesting especially over Osorio. I can, I can maybe understand Michael Bradley, um, but, but to do it over Osorio was interesting for me. Yeah, I think they did that on purpose. Uh, um, Nelson has been um, watching their previous games. He's been super lively and just probably probably the one linking attack um, defense to attack. He's essentially a box-to-box midfielder. He's been linking their t- uh, defense uh, to their attack, and if you wanted to starve off the Italians, you press him. You press Nelson, and I think Neville was correct uh, on doing that. And and we saw it from the press box that it, it worked uh, because Nelson just couldn't get anywhere. He tried, you know, pressing or trying a couple of tricks to get past. And he was successful at times, but, you know, stymieing uh, Jordy Nelson, Jordy Nelson, if I got his name incorrect, Nelson. Jaden, um, Jaden. Jordy's Jayden the Nelson. Packer. <laughs> yeah, football. Yeah, uh, Jaden Nelson stymieing him. Uh, essentially killed off uh, what Insigne and, and Bernadeschi was about to, uh, supposed to do because even from our, our vantage point there are times in the game where the two of them switched in, uh, Insigne and Nelson where Nelson was out on the wing and, and Insigne was tucking inside and I think um, they were just trying to get uh, the two Italians on the ball and and when you press Nelson uh, you know that started off Insigne 
And now Insigne had to drop in the midfield to try to get on the ball. And that that this played into Miami's advantage because he's far away from the ball, although he did score that that wonder goal from outside the 18 first time. Um, yeah, it just essentially stymied any offensive progress they made. And and because of that, you know, obviously they had to exert more energy. They got tired quicker. And Miami, um, they're the probably the fittest team in the league. They were able to 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 kill that off with their defense and and, you know, I will say that last 10 minutes of the game was absolutely just crazy in, in terms of the counterattacking. I think the guys were just gassed and, yeah. you know, it, it got ugly, but they held on. But besides that, the, defensively, the tactics were really spot on in regards to that. Well, don't don't just gloss over that because I think that that's important. Like, Inter Miami's mm-hmm. gotten in a lot of those games. Before this, we had talked about five straight games scoring the 80th or later at home. I, I mean, they want the last 10 minutes to look like that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, because yeah. that's when Inter Miami has been comfortable – Bill's talked about the conditioning all season long, how great it is. He called him the fittest team in the league. I mean, that, yeah. that's sort of what he wants it to look like. Yeah, and that's not a bad thing. I know they get a lot of flack for maybe not being as, you know, free-flowing, attacking, ticky-taka. For instance, okay, for example, Barcelona don't even, don't even play that style anymore. So the fact that it's still in the uh, soccer vernacular of everyone needs to, like, stop. They don't play ticky-taka anymore. I know Xavi's trying to kind of reinvented but it, it's not the same so Miami's not going to play that if Barcelona's not doing it with their players Miami's not doing it Miami has found their own style which worked for them and Neville and the players are getting the most out of it and you know they're able to see like guys like Coco Jean who is still not back from injury but I think we'll we'll hear from that soon uh, Pozuelo we see players coming into the team and being able to fit into it seamless, seamlessly that's what you want in in uh, an organization essentially because you know you look at inter miami cf2 you know you can get a guy like i don't know um uh abel caputo and he can slide in uh, to uh, you know a defensive midfielder or a center back seamlessly if if he were to get a, a first team contract or a loan or something so um you know i think this is just like the foundation of the beginning of what they want inter miami to be they want it to be a, a pipeline from the academy uh, to enter my CF, enter my CF2 to the first team where players can just, even players outside of the organization that they buy, you know, just fit in seamlessly with the, the setup that they've got going on. And this is a bit of a side note, Green, um, the novel did get his green card. So this, that's, we're just going to assume that's a pretty big indicator that he will be back next season as the coach. So even then he'll have his opportunity to bring in um, two more DPs or three, you know, if Pozuelo goes, but I don't think that'll happen. Or if Iguain, you know, what's going on with him. Uh, now we'll be able to bring in players that, you know, will elevate this system even more next season. And I think um, even with the sanctions, which they've gotten a lot of that money back, I think it's just going to be uh, real smooth sailing for um, uh, the team going forward in regards to that. All right. So we have arrived at the part of the show where our good friend Austin, well, you know, we're a little bit worried about you, man. Alex and I have been talking and, You've had some fiery takes on Alejandro Pozuelo in, in the past couple of weeks, of which, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, all of them have pretty much turned out to not be the case. <laughs> so for, first, the floor is yours. Um, we, we want to give you the opportunity to explain yourself or what the, uh, the initial uh, prognosis was on your part before we absolutely eviscerate you. Go ahead. <laughs> Yes. So to give everybody context, uh, a couple weeks back at one of Inter Miami's home games, uh, I was expressing to both Ian and Alex that I wasn't fully sold yet on Alejandro Pasuelo. And it was for, you know, a number of reasons. Um, Do I regret what I said? He's made me eat my words a little bit. Yes. But here is what I was saying at the time. (laughs) Maybe a lot. Here's what I was saying at the time. Um, it, it's taken Pozuelo uh, some time to adjust and be as effective as he is right now. And maybe all of my words were a little bit, um, what's that? What's the word? Um, they, they just came too early. I didn't give him enough time. Mm. And so the idea behind it was for me, a lot of the times Pozuelo would get caught with the ball. And there was one player that I might or might not have related him to that I, am almost ashamed to say at this point, um, especially when Pozzolo was out playing on the left wing instead of as the number 10 at times was 
Rodolfo Pizarro, who liked to have a dribble and turn his back and shield off defenders and lose the ball to the opposition. Um, so there were times earlier on when he first started playing for Miami that I was a little bit worried. I was worried that he was not instinctive enough on the ball. I thought there were times where he would hold it too long and, you know, granted what he's done for the team and his, his numbers, when you look at XG plus XA and all of these things, they are perfect metrics for a number 10 in MLS. He's literally the perfect 10 in MLS. But for me, there were times where I thought he just didn't do enough. And in the last three weeks, well, he's got us to fifth place in the Eastern Conference. So, I, I mean, at this point, there's really not much to be said. And I definitely have to eat my words. I'm glad I said it because I think I put a reverse jinx on him. I, I don't want to take all the credit for what he's done, but I think I put a reverse jinx on him. And uh, I, I just want to say to anyone who didn't hear this, which it was pretty much everyone. Cause I didn't make it public. I was a little bit, yeah. I was a little bit worried about doing that. I didn't make it public. It was just a press conference or a press room talk. Um, but for, for the most part, I, uh, I, I do need to eat my words. Yes. Alex, you want to take him down first or did he already do it? He kind of already did it. Himself. Yeah, yeah. I did it himself. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think I'm glad he saw the light. I think, you know, as well as just one of the players that are MLS proven and a no brainer when, they had the opportunity to sign him. It's not like it's nothing like Pizarro because he came from Liga MX and it, it took him. Oh, well, he did score on Miami's home. Uh, 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 um, well, the DC away game. It wasn't. Uh, yeah, the first game of the season, I think. Okay. Anyway, it was so long ago, but Pizarro did score uh, the first goal in Inter Miami history. But it, it took him a while to get really acclimated, and he still honestly didn't get acclimated. And that's part of the reason why he's not with the team now. He, he wasn't able to. Uh, get all along on the field with uh, uh, chemistry wise uh, with uh, some of the, the, you know, players and in regards to just mainly Iwain, they, they didn't have that chemistry connection that Pozuelo and, and Gonzalo do. So I think that's a big plus uh, Pozuelo. He, you know, he wants to be in Miami. His kids are here. You know uh, he said he, he likes the weather and, you know, he's from Sevilla, Sevilla from in Spain. So um, Seville, Sevilla, Seville. Uh, in Spain. So, uh, you know, I think the weather's sort of similar in that regard too. So um, yeah, I think it was just the, the right fit at the right time. And, and Miami are seeing, uh, they're, 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 they're seeing the the fruits of their labor really. And, you know, they're, they're looking at home field advantage potentially uh, in the playoffs. And it, 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 it's not solely because of Pozuelo, but his presence certainly helped lifted the team's uh, spirit and, and their level. I mean, yeah, I think like we said earlier, I, I think he's unlocked Gregory and Mota to their best possible ability. Gregory's always had it, but I think Mota needed it more a little bit more than Gregory did, and it's it's worked out perfectly. He's got a really good connection with Higuain. Uh, so I think a lot of what he's done has been extremely beneficial to Inter Miami, and he is in no way in any regard close to the type of player Rodolfo Pizarro was for Inter Miami. Uh, so I take it all back. But I do want to pose a question to you guys based off of his his performances so far and what he does throughout the season, does he come back on a designated player deal? Does Chris Henderson give him DP money? And I, I mean, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I would like, I would, I would like I to see Miami yeah. retain him. I mean, as a DP, no, you, oh. you wouldn't bring Pozuelo back. As a DP. Oh, Pozuelo. Oh, I thought we were talking about Ewan. Pozuelo. Yes. No, of Pozuelo, course. Pozuelo, Pozuelo, Pozuelo. <laughs> yeah, so as Pozuelo, a DP, of course. You're 100% good with giving him. Oh, yeah, him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, well, Pozuelo, yeah, of course. He's Iguain, still early, that's a different story. He's still in his early 30s. I mean, he's yeah. two years removed from a league MVP. He's still playing yeah. at a high rate. I thought all of that nonsense early on in the season from, from Toronto talking about, like, he's yeah. only a peace taker. And, and he, I mean, he didn't get along with that locker room. That was just a bad fit for him. Um, and, and that's fine. He didn't really, I don't think that he, I think he said this, that he didn't like the, the you know, he wasn't happy there. No, um, he said it. Yeah. And, and he's, he's definitely happy here. Um, you know, I, I think that he gets along with, especially too, which is, <laughs> uh, you know, I was talking about it last week with you. This did not have to go well. I mean, especially with, with Iguain, it did not. And in any regard, and the fact that it did is, is great. I mean, for Iguain to have a guy that he really buys into and trusts fully is, has been revolutionary for this team. Um, so I, I think, just to hammer home the the Pizarro Pozuelo thing, I mean, name one player that Pizarro made better on Inter Miami. Not one, right? not one. Yeah, I'm not Robbie trying to answer this for like seriously. Two games, right? Um, Robbie for like two games last year. I, I mean, I'm just like like Lewis, I guess, but Lewis was was playing like that entire different weird wingback role last year, right? I'd because say, 
there was that one game against Atlanta where Pizarro played as a box to box midfielder and he did actually pretty well. I was well. there for that game. Yeah. I would I remember that. That was in Atlanta. And mm-hmm. um what what was the what was the reasoning for that? Was it a Gregory suspension? I believe Yeah, I think someone when was in doubt. <laughs> when in doubt. I, I believe it was though, because I remember and yeah, no, a hundred percent. And uh I do remember that game. But I, I still don't think on a consistent basis Pos- uh, Pizarro did to any player as Pozuelo is doing and, to but, him. But I'll make the I'll make the counter is he he's not only great Pozuelo but he's made Iguain great he's he's made Gregory even better than he already he's Bryce really Duke, made Malta about... a lot better. Mm-hmm. Last Bryce Duke, yeah. yeah, Bryce Duke as well. Bryce Duke has improved a lot with Pozuelo. Um, so I mean I I really think that it's it's unfortunate i think that the only player that maybe hasn't is robert taylor right is is he's sort of kind yeah. of left in no man's land right now trying he's to figure done that the out Lewis morgan wing back treatment right but he's playing he's well there so sort of being asked to do a similar thing yeah. but i think that we're all still pretty high on robert taylor yeah 100 um, percent. yeah uh, so so i guess from to just bring it all home in terms of of what pozuelo brings to you He's not only happy from a cultural standpoint, he's not only making the locker room what he's called the best locker room he's ever played in. He's not only playing well on the field, but he's also making others around him better. He's checking all four boxes right now. And he's scoring goals and he's doing assists. The assist is probably even more important than the goals as far as I'm concerned for Pozuelo. So you, uh, I, I just don't see why he's anything but a designated player. And his, even his designated player like salary right now, I think we're talking like a couple mil. He's not up to like six where Gonzalo is. So absolutely, I bring him back on a DP deal. If you look at his numbers uh, per 90 and the percentiles he's in, progressive, pass, progressive passes per 90 minutes, he's in the 93rd percentile in the league. Pass completion, he's in the 85th percentile. So he's not only taking a, or like attempting a bunch of progressive passes, but he's doing it at an extremely high rate. Progressive carries as well, so not just passes, 87th percentile, 86th percentile and dribbles completed. Um I mean, I think that there's a lot to be said about what he's done this year and the type of player he is. And also another one that's huge, his expected goals assisted per 90. He's in the 85th percentile in the league. So at that point, you, you if you're someone like like me, you you eat your words and say, yeah, just sign him on a DP deal because <laughs> you, you need him. And I think then the next question is, uh, if Higuain doesn't come back, and we can save this for another topic, but if Higuain doesn't come back, Campana doesn't stay because of a loan deal. You got to find a striker to fit with Pozuelo. Can he fit with any striker? Most Wait, likely. Now you have a designated player spot open. Right? And you have, Malongo, exactly. You have, you have from LAFC would be ideal. So there's, there's a lot know. to be this said. It's not reporting. It's just, it's <laughs> just a like spitballing. But there, there's yeah. a lot to be said about Pozuelo's fit within this team and what they're going to have to do to build around him if they do give him a DP deal with another DP or maybe two. So, Austin, we will let you off the hook. You have seen the lights. <laughs> And we are very thankful for you uh, joining uh, on this train, this this Inter Miami train that is getting a little crowded. If you looked around the league in, in terms of Alex, how many national radio hits did you have last week? All of a sudden, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I, it was, yeah, it was, yeah, I don't know, it's just, uh, yeah, everybody all of a sudden, they're 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 Inter Miami is in high demand. They want it. Yeah, where have y'all been? it is what it is. You. you know. Yeah, I'm sure all you guys have just been getting a bunch of comments and, and DMs about, you know, what's going on with Inner Miami and, then, you know, local news as well. They're starting to jump on the bandwagon again, which, uh, yeah, they should have done it for the entire season, honestly. It's it's Miami sports, so the well, South Florida sports, so they should have. But, yeah, you know, Miami's coming around and, um, you know, people are just interested, you know, um, for a large part of the parts of the season, they were quiet, um, you know, maybe – yeah, they were just quiet. Maybe they weren't playing the most aesthetically pleasing soccer, so they probably just didn't get a bunch of attention. But now, you know, with the playoffs looming and them going on this roll and Pozuelo in, you know, it, you know, it's a different feel. And the fans feel that way. You know, national media does, local media. We do um, covering the team as well. And it, it's just really uh, interesting to see that evolution over the season. So let's talk this weekend's opponent, New York Red Bulls in uh, New Jersey at Red Bull Arena, uh, a, a place where – Red Bulls haven't really played very well as of late. They're winless in their past four, three losses and a draw. They did earn that draw uh, this past week against Cincinnati. Uh, But really since that debacle against Orlando in the Open Cup, they they haven't gotten going. They've only had one win in their past uh, six or seven games in all competitions, if you include the Barcelona friendly that they had, um, that that they've had. 
They're now in the mix with Inter Miami, with Columbus maybe, and we'll throw Orlando possibly in there for that last home field advantage uh, spot. Let's go back to earlier this season when Inter Miami first really started getting it going in mid-May. That 2-0 win, uh, Lasseter scored right off the, 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 the half-hour mark. And then you had, um, who was it, Robert Taylor finished with that beautiful uh, goal that he had. So um, a, a very similar, I was looking back at that game uh, earlier this week, and I was, I was thinking about how they played in it, and it was almost like a 4-4-2 diamond was, was where Inter Miami came at them with. I, I don't know, you still have some like moving parts that, that you know, maybe don't fit as well. Um, in, in that game, Campana instead of Higuain was going to be at Bryce Duke instead of Pozuelo. Yeah. Um, so, so a little bit of a different look that Inter Miami might give this time. Uh, but it, if ever you were going to catch Red Bulls, now would probably be the time that you'd want to do it. Inter Miami riding high, Red Bull struggling at home. This sort of sets up for opportunity, if it will, but it also could set up for a, a reset for Red Bulls to get back to where they were and, and sort of you know, realize that they're not as bad as they've been playing late. Well, yeah, if you look at their last, I think it's seven games now, including uh, Open Cup, they've only won one time. Uh, and that was against Atlanta away from home uh, last Wednesday. So you, you look at what they've done. They, they've been in, I mean, they're all over the place. They've had shootouts. They had the 5-4 game against Colorado. They've had nil nils. They've had one nils. They've had one ones. Um, the, the Open Cup game was 5-1. Like you said, the debacle against Orlando. So there's a lot to be said for what this team isn't doing on a consistent level. And if, like you said, Ian, if there's any time for Miami to catch them, it's right now when they're being consistent and they're doing what they need to do. The only thing that gets to me is always in every single year is that, that New York style press or Red Bull style press. And, and to see what somebody like Gonzalo Higuain is going to do when facing that. And not only Gonzalo Higuain, but we have to look at the center backs now and say, look, they weren't under a lot of, they were under too much pressure later on in the match against Toronto. I thought low and Stale were passing the ball. Well, they were switching wings well, and they were taking their time and they were comfortable on the ball, but New York's not going to make this a comfortable game for Miami. And this is where they really need to outshine them and in their press and break lines easy and make simple passes in order to, to progress the ball forward in a manner in which they can get good chances uh, in and around the box. I think that that's going to be the most important thing for them is how they deal with that New York style press. And if the center backs and this midfield, they are capable of playing within each other to, to break the lines and move the ball forward without too much pressure. Nothing to add there. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, there, there was talk that Lewis Morgan was um, potentially making a move to Huddersfield that has now since gone. So maybe he will have a little more of a focus, especially going up against his former club. He's had a heck of a season. Um, I think Millwall was also interested in uh, Lewis for a little bit. How much do you think that that plays in? I don't know. I, I mean, he has had a great season. Um, and, and, and what he's been able to do really leading this club, him and, and Caceres have, have been the guys that um, have really pushed them. I, I'm interested to see how Phil will handle that sort of midfield that looks a lot different than the Montreal's, than the Toronto's, than the NYCFC's that we've seen. It's a lot more spread out. It's a lot more high wing play um, than Inter Miami has done. Tactically, Alex, how would you address that instead of, that midfield trio that they've seen the past couple of weeks, it's now going to be a lot more spread out. Like Austin said, it's going to be a lot more higher press. They're going to try and get up the field and then sort of swarm you and cover you from that regard. I think they'll revert to uh Miami will revert back to a, a five back, um, you know, just to have that extra cover on the wings. You know, I don't think they can play a flat, flat back four with, with McVeigh as a, as a fullback anyway, I think he'll just be tin, pinned back too, too much with, um, you know, whoever is playing on his side, and I don't think it'll work. I think they'll go with a kind of like a a, a three four, maybe a three four three with Bryce Duke starting, and maybe Ariel Lasseter as a two. Uh, actually, I don't know, but I think they'll play with the back three, back five. You know, maybe Bryce Duke starts to give them some more energy in midfield. Um, I think Lasseter will probably start again just to have that pace over the top, and um. And Eagle as well. I'm just trying to think, you know, how do they? It could be a 3 4 1 2 Pozuelo play in that whole Lasseter, Eagle, um, you know, Robert Taylor on the left. I think it'll, I think it'll look similar to that, that Montreal game, that, that the same lineup, the same, um, you know, um, 
just set up. I think, you know, if Campana was healthy, I, I would have, you know, maybe started him just to add some physicality. But, you know, he's still working his way back from injury. But, yeah, I think they'll go with the flat back five just to deal with the width. And then Neville will probably have Yedlin and Taylor, uh, you know, push up really high so they're not ping, pinned back the entire time. And I think it's just going to be, you know, blow for blow, you know, counter and counterattacking uh, soccer, essentially. The standings as it looks, Red Bulls up uh, five points, but what played one more game at 41 points, Inter-Miami at 36 points, Red Bulls plus eight in the goal differential category to Inter-Miami's minus eight. Um, so definitely would need to make up room. Inter-Miami also has those, you know, great wins that that first tiebreaker we keep talking about, 10 wins, going to be a huge advantage with Red Bulls, even though they're five points up, they only have 11 wins. So a, a, a three points would go huge. Other big games this weekend, Cincinnati and Columbus, hell is real, going to be a, a very big uh, game for both clubs. Inter-Miami probably hoping for a draw in that. Cincinnati winning would be better than Columbus. Um, mm -hmm. And then on Sunday, you have Orlando hosting NYCFC and Revs hosting Galaxy. Those are going to be the big ones that really directly affect, you know, you can go to your Charlotte versus Toronto's. We'll keep an eye out on them uh, as, as we go, but this large pack of, of the East is starting to, at least you're, you're starting, you know that scene in Star Wars where they're trying to figure out how to get out of that trash compactor <laughs> as they're going through? We're, we're, we're starting to, to get that going as the trash compactor is starting to, to move these walls in and, and teams are finding their little ones bit by bit, Austin. Is Alejandro Pasuela Luke Skywalker? Is he the one that's diving <laughs> under the water to figure it out? Yeah, that's that's kind of what it is. And John no. Mota C3PO trying to figure <laughs> out a way to shut her off in the back. <laughs> oh, oh man, Star Wars. Oh, we're nerds, Ian. Um, so <laughs> I love it though. Um, no, I think I mean it's it's a good thing to watch all these games. There's there's a lot to be said for Miami now, as we talked about in the beginning of the show, controlling their own destiny. But at the same time, they might still need a little bit of help. You don't expect Miami to win out or drop or not drop any points going going forward. Um, and if you do, you're crazy. And maybe somebody's crazy and that's OK. Uh, but you have enough room here now to, to say you can drop points and pick up points. It's just where you pick up points. And that's why we're focusing on certain games. We're going to focus on the Columbus games. We're going to focus on the Orlando game. Uh, th there are certain things to look at when when going forward. And you look around the league, Miami's gotten a crap ton of help. I almost cursed it. We, they have gotten a crap ton of help uh, in the last two or three weeks in terms of results going their way. And I, I would say it's even been longer than two or three weeks because there was a time before this five game stretch where they were losing and results were still going their the way. New York, the New York City FC week, that week, which was yeah. the one loss amidst all this. No one else won. Exactly. Everybody either tied or lost as well. Which is the which is the craziest part. So they've now finally capitalized on that and now the fact that we are sitting here watching all these other games unfold and that trash compactor is coming in and getting down to the bitter end of it i mean <laughs> this is probably going to go to decision day I'm, I'm almost positive because it's mls and the parody is just needed at this point um but i, I really think that there is potential for Miami to solidify themselves as a playoff team before the Montreal game. But again, that Montreal game, if they're solidifying themselves in the playoffs could be an easy one at home. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that's going to be, um, well, if the Orlando game wasn't rescheduled, I thought, you know, you know, I thought that was going to be the game, but you know, Montreal at home last, last game of the season, it could be, yeah, it could be huge. You know, I you know, Dry Pink will certainly be sold out and, and rocking. And I think it's a 2.30 game, so it's an early game. So the heat may affect uh, the – I I was about to call them the impact, I, you know, whatever. Uh, the heat was or, or is probably going to uh, impact Montreal. Uh, and, you know, well, yeah. Um... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a, a huge game and, and possibly, you know, one where Miami's fighting for their, their playoff uh, – live so um you know we'll see i've made the prediction uh many times so I'll, I'll say it here for pod references as well my prediction if inter miami gets four points against red bulls and crew in these next two games they will have a home game in the mls cup playoffs if you're at 40 points with six games to go 
you're more than light and three of those are at home and you're one of the best home teams in MLS, the, uh, the, the likelihood of you being a home team is, is very high. Forgive me for all the, the buzzes because I, I know that they keep happening. It is election day when we're recording mm -hmm. this and I'm getting a million texts from all yeah. the people. So yes. I can't shut it off, but <laughs> I'm sure everybody knows that, that they're, you're all getting the text too. So um, <laughs> I've been getting them for like a week, two yeah, weeks now. It, it's not all the excitement around uh, Inter Miami, unfortunately. But guys, there is more excitement in another playoff race, a couple more playoff races all around South Florida. Uh, as we're watching other games, Austin, you were watching Inter Miami 2 this past weekend um, as they came up with a huge three points against Rochester. They're sitting right there in that third uh, position in, in their uh, MLS Next Pro right now. Only the top four make it in a six-team battle that they're really that one will come down to the final uh, game of the season in what was a, a really crazy league. I mean, there are no ties. So they go to penalty shootout. So you get two points if you win the shootout, one point if you don't. Um, so, so a lot of crazy rules. And so that can make a, a lot of uh, interesting things happen towards the end of the year here. Yeah. And a lot of what I saw in that match was very reminiscent of what Inter Miami, the first team, did the day before. It was a hard fought game. People were getting tired. It was aggressive. A lot of fouls were happening back and forth. And Miami defensively had to keep the ball in front of them. They did. They actually got the clean sheet. The second team did. And then they went in and scored two goals. Uh, this one, I, I would say, is probably a little bit more uh, against the run of play than the Toronto match with the first team. Because the second team, it really looked like they were down and out in that first half. I'll be honest with you. I thought it was extremely rough. But there was a great ball played in over the top. And it was squared perfectly to Georgia Costa. They get that breakaway goal in the 55th minute. And it was from there. It wasn't necessarily cruise, like, you know, smooth sailing. Uh, they, they weren't in cruise control. The defense was still having to work extremely hard. So I give a lot of credit to the defenders and how Darren Powell had them set up and organized. Um, and they kept the ball in front of them. What, what wasn't too much to be asked of Nick Marsman. There were times where, which is another topic we definitely need to discuss at some point. There were times where Nick Marsman did look a little bit shaky, but at the end of the day, he was doing enough. Uh, the defense helped them out a lot and, and they kept Rochester out of the goal and they ended up getting their second on another breakaway. So there was time and time again, where Rochester dominated the ball and Miami were able to, to, to go forward. And you look at the playoffs, uh, Darren Powell did tell me that they're not necessarily worried about that right now. They're worried about the growth and everything of their players. But when you have five first teamers playing uh, and, and you're trying to recover them and things like that, and you have a bunch of, you know, younger first team players playing too, and a, potential one coming forward in Harvey Neville, but we'll talk about that too. Mm -hmm. um, th there is real hope that they can continue their season into the, into the postseason because it stays competitive. It's always competitive MLS next pro because of the no ties. Uh, but they have, I think the way it works actually in the standings, it's, it is the top four teams essentially, but it's each conference is broken down into divisions. And so each winner of the division will go on to the playoffs and then the next best second place team or something like that will will move on as well. It's a weird thing, but Miami are there right now. They pretty much control their own destiny, just like Inter Miami. The first team did, and that was something that I posed to to Darren Powell too, was that both teams, first and second, solidified this weekend that they control their own destiny to make the postseason. And he's just talked. He talked about the structure of the organization and how well everybody has has been uh, from top to bottom. It's been a completely cohesive unit between the first, second team and academy. Well, and you I go to U, just... right, the success the U 15s had it's, when it went exactly. It so uh, I, I really think that there's a lot there. My my, I guess the bigger question is going to be how does the roster freeze uh, date upcoming uh, impact whether players are staying with. Uh, I, and so you want to call them the impact. I keep wanting to call them Fort Lauderdale, whether they stay with yeah. Inter Miami too, or, or they go up to, to the senior team. Yeah, I, I think it's really important. And just today, well, actually Sunday, but just today um, we, there was speculation about Harvey Neville's green card and it's been confirmed today in training uh, from Michelle Kaufman that Harvey Neville did receive his green card on the trip. So yeah. if you remember those talks way earlier on in the season about, when Noah Allen got signed is, is Harvey Neville going to get signed? Because, you know, they needed a backup right back. They still do. And we're all the way down to when you're about to freeze the roster and you still don't have someone to replace DeAndre Yedlin. And, you know, down the stretch, yellow card accumulation can catch up the players and all of these things, maybe even rest if he needs it. Um, so if Harvey Neville or now Harvey Neville has his green card, 
in the next week or so, I, I think there's a real, real, real possibility. I'm leaning towards 75% that he gets called up to the first team because they need the depth. And in terms of what it does for the second team, you look at the Noah Allens and the Joven Joneses and the players that are consistently playing in that team that are actually first team players, you have 30 spots. So realistically, they're going to be named just as depth pieces. But a lot of their time is coming with the second team. And I think that's very, very noteworthy. Well, real, real fast, you mentioned, you know, you have no depth that, right back. And some people might hear that and go, oh, well, you have Victor Uoa that you can slot in there. But don't forget, I mean, like, Uoa hasn't even played a lot. Even he Not has fewer minutes this year than Mo Adams. So uh, he wow. really hasn't played. Yeah, Mo a Adams lot. is he's not on the team in. anymore. So. Right, he hasn't appeared. He's appeared in a lot of games, but he hasn't played a lot of minutes. So yeah. I, I think you're right there, Alex. You watch this team very closely too. There's a lot of upcoming promising talent on there. As we look towards the roster freeze, who are some of the names that you would like to see go up to senior in Tester Luck or stay and help the, the Inter Miami too for the rest of the season? Um, honestly, I don't think there's anyone who, uh, well, well, George Acosta, but he's already on the first team, but I don't think any inner Miami CF two players per se that are quite ready to make the jump, maybe, uh, Schneider Borgelin just as, you know, some depth, but still it, it would be, uh, foolish to, to take him out of a situation where he's starting and scoring consistently to have a ride the bench in MLS. But yeah, other than that, no one in particular, all of them are, are, are doing well and developing in an MLS Next Pro. So I think if you were to bring any of them up, uh, I think it'd be too soon. Maybe Abel Caputo, you know, Harvey Neville, guys like that who are, are, are ready for MLS, you know, maybe as depth players. Um, but other than that, no one, no one specifically really. But they're, they've all been really good this season. And, and the team's been super fun to watch. And Darren Powell has done a really good job on, uh, you know, just building that team up and, and, and developing them. And, um, yeah, no one, no one specifically, but they're a good squad. They just have a, a couple more games left in their season. Very wonky ends to their season. They'll play like three games in eight days where right now they have two weeks off before they play their next one. So we'll keep an eye out on that playoff race. Also, you know, still on the back burner, they still have a, 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 a team that still has quite a bit of a ways, ironically enough, in their season. Miami FC, who's been on a great tear as of late. They've, they've won five of their last seven. Um, they're up to six in USL championship as well. Um, so they're looking to to really be com getting comfortable in in their playoff race as well. So uh, the, they'll keep playing. They got some a couple home games. Just won two on the road. Uh, a couple of uh, two nil wins for Miami FC, uh, and they're playing some of their best soccer of the year. Uh, really, especially in defense, a, a team that's really starting to um, find its own defensive shape and and starting to control games at times. Towards the beginning of the year, a little bit uh, of of those up and down USL games that we've seen. They're really starting to uh, really impress me in the last game with uh, the, the control that they seem to be taking and, and the, the formidableness uh, that they showed. Guys, it will be a very interesting one from Red Bull Arena this weekend as Inter Miami continues the playoff run against Red Bull New York uh, this Saturday and a chance to really start making an impact as they try to get not only into the playoffs, but can't believe we're saying it. Home field advantage in the playoffs. She is Alex Winley. He is Austin Robillard. For our producer, Andres, I am Ian Hess. Make sure you follow us on Twitter, on Instagram. Subscribe on YouTube. Uh, share, comment. We love your rates, your reviews on wherever you get your podcasts. Spotify, Apple, wherever you get it. And we will see you here at the Heron Outlet this time next week.